Uh, Lola, as, as many, I'm gonna, the, here's how this all goes. A lot of you have been here before. So I'm just blah, blah, blah for a second before we get to the actually interesting person, Lola. But um, uh, we started this series uh, over a year ago in order to talk with some people who engage in some acts called avant-garde or non-traditional or uh, good theater. And, um, and it was uh, a, uh, an idea developed between myself and Jim Nicola, who's here, and Linda Chapman, who's here, and Rachel Silverman, who's here, uh, in order to uh, broaden the dialogue, basically, between performers and theater artists about how we do our work, because so often our work and the conversations around it uh, become obsessed with how to make it, how to fund it, how to do it, how to get paid doing it, how to become famous, how to pay our rent, all that. And we neglect the actual questions that a few artists have engaged with, which include how to actually make work that is meaningful, and <coughs> interesting, and relevant, and good. So we decided to, to talk with those people. And uh, something I say a lot before these things is that this conversation isn't to indict any other type of theater or um, say that it's not valuable. It's just to talk about why we work in a different way, why people might choose to work in a different way, did, have, continue to, and, uh, and talk with those people because they're great and they're the true um, pioneers of everything we do. So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Lola Peschlinski, uh, who's worked, worked with, uh, for many years with the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. She is a founding member of the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. She created more than 17, she, 17 roles in 13 years, won two Obie Awards with the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, and another Obie Award for the play Gertrude and Alice, which she wrote with Linda Chapman. Uh, numerous appearances on film and television. Uh, also a brilliant uh, appearance in Quills at this very theater. And um, if Everett comes in, I will also give him an introduction. But um, until then, we decided we're gonna do something different. This is the first time we've ever done this because so often we do these things and people say, I didn't know the work of the company beforehand. So the conversation was interesting, but I'd love the work. So we've decided to show you a short bit of uh, a scene between Lola and Everett wow. uh, before we start. So if we can just hit those lights, please. Should we set it up a little bit? Oh yeah, here, Lola set it up for us, All right. Uh, Charles decided to make a film Starring Everett, it was called The Sorrows of Dolores. It's on DVD and can be bought. Uh, and in the film, uh, uh, Everett as Dolores is a is a is an orphan and um, runs away from the people that he's been um, uh, staying with and uh, decides to go into a gypsy fortune, uh, fortune uh, telling uh, parlor to see what will happen to her. And that's what is the setup. It's the first, it's the second scene in the
So that's a, at least an example of the work you started to do with Charles Ludlum. Yes, I guess so. I, I think uh, because it's a silent film, it's, the acting is like silent film acting. And um, in the beginning of the theater's life, we took our, a lot of our acting uh, gestures and of our acting was built on silent film acting, but in the sense that the movies themselves were built on silent film acting, that the, in the beginning of in the history of the beginning of the history of, um, of movies, uh, a lot of stage actors uh, were brought East, or were brought west to, uh, or even they were on, never mind, I'll, I, I digress a lot, so I'm sorry. Um, a, a lot of uh, stage actors who used what we would call a silent screen, screen, screen technique were at the beginning of uh, created uh, silent film acting. And um, they were known as uh, people who did very broad uh, acting. It was based on uh, the Del Sart method of, of uh, acting with great big gestures and um, big, a 
big uh, makeup and all that sort of thing. However long that lasted, but in a sense that scene harks back to that original, uh, uh, that original impulse and um, way of doing things. Uh, but I mean, it got softened by the fact that we spoke and that we used, um, it wasn't just gestures like that, but um, voice and, you know, just building character and the way we act now. Can you? Or something like that. Can you I give, can't remember exactly. Can you give, uh, for, for everyone here who isn't uh, familiar with the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, a little background on uh, how you met Charles to begin with, and how and how the work started. Hmm. Uh, well, it really started uh, with John Vaccaro uh, and Jack Smith. They were friends, uh, and Ronald Tavell. You mustn't leave out Ronnie because he was the one who was writing the first plays of of what became the Ridiculous Theater Movement. And John Vaccaro was the first director. And um, it was Ronnie Tavell who <coughs> coined the phrase, we've gone beyond the absurd, our position is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Ronnie wrote these first plays. <laughs> needed um, uh, someone to play uh, Tom, the taxi driver, and they had lost one uh, actor, who, the actor who was playing him, and found um, Charles uh, through uh, Chris Scott, who was a friend of his. Um, and um, so Charles was brought in. John was someone who um, whose influence was Anthony Marteau, and he uh, was, um, uh, he believed in all this bold um, type of uh, acting, broad gestures, uh, very, uh, very filthy. and became good friends, as, and as he did with all the rest of the cast of Black and Brave the Driver. And um, ultimately, uh, Ronnie, Ronald Tavell wrote um, Gorilla Queen, which was a big major play with lots of actors and lots of characters. And uh, John Vaccaro felt he couldn't put it on Expensive. It was too this, it was too intellectual, it was too a lot of things that Vaccaro didn't like for one reason or other. Either he couldn't handle it or he just didn't want it. Anyway, he and uh, Ronnie came to a parting of the ways and he kind of fell in love with Charles, who offered him uh, his first play called Big Hotel. And uh, we started rehearsing that. And then he and Charles had a falling out, and we all we all went and they separated, and we all went with Charles, and that's how we created the ridiculous theatrical company. It was first called the Glock, the Glockzinia Theatrical Company. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've lost some black like syndrome. Anyway, next <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> when you all separated, those were, were they about, uh, were they artistic differences? Or financial differences? Or ego differences? What, what actually? All of those, actually. Yeah. Yes. All together? All together. All what were the most interesting of those differences? Well, the, uh, what was the last one you said? Uh, Financial? Ego. Artistic? Ego. Ego. Ego? Ego. Yes. Well, John was furious with Jaws because he wouldn't come over at 5 o'clock in the morning to cut his hair. <laughs> and, uh, they had a very funny uh, phone conversation that both of them wished had been taped because they thought it was Burbank talking to Oscar Wilde and they laughed as much as they were hating each other. So <laughs> they anyway they they split because of that and uh, Charles had signed a contract that he shouldn't have and uh, but it wasn't such a bad thing because he did get a little check and he was one of the playwrights one of the few, few playwrights that I know of who had the two productions of the same play running at the same time in New York City. We were putting on the conquest of, uh, we were putting on the conquest of the universe. No, we were putting on When Queens Go Was it When Queens Collide? When Queens Collide. Yeah. <laughs> we were putting on When Queens Collide, and John was putting on the conquest of the universe. They were the exact same play, <laughs> but we had to change the name uh, to protect the innocent. The innocent. Somebody, but not <laughs> the guilty. The contract. The one who had made him, uh, uh, John Chamberlain, the painter, was producing uh, Vaccaro's version of the play, and uh, so Charles signed that contract and would get a, a little check because they had uh, all the um, Warhol uh, acolytes were in the play. Conquest of the Universe uh, with uh, Mary Warren off and um, uh, I can't remember his name. He's, he's like Chaplin. Um, he's like Chaplin. I can't remember his name. But a lot of other Warhol hits. And um, so they were playing for uh, an off board off Broadway contract that gave people salaries and Charles would get a small royalty check every once in a while. And we were, uh, we were performing at midnight in the, uh, in the uh, theater for the new city. Um, for, and we actually made some money just by splitting the box office and, um, and only having two performances on Friday and Saturday nights, and uh, so I remember being thrilled with getting a check for $25, I think it was, wow, <laughs> wow, wow, <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, uh, every day was uh, thrilling, what was but we're not ready for every day. What? What was that overlap like with the with the community from with Warhol and the factory? What was that whole, What was that dialogue like at that time? The dialogue between well, between your work or between the actual dialogue or what was the the interaction? Was there an interaction? Was there a relationship? Between, no, they hated us and we hated them. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Yeah. They, they, they stole his play. <coughs> They did. Yeah. Well, we didn't. Hate them. Well, yes, there was a rivalry, but who was better and who was good. And anyway, I went. No one would go to see me. And the other one, I, I did. I wanted to go and see that play. And it was just as fun. It was, it was actually quite wonderful in its own uh, nasty. The Warhol people were nasty. <laughs> And uh, and we were uh, we were once called uh, that we had a warm sort of anarchy uh, in our own ways. And, um, uh, and that was you know more or less there was a, a kind of uh, 
made a um, rivalry. Uh, and the opening night of our of another play called that was called The Garden of Earthly Delights, um, which was based on the satirical plays. And um, I don't know that there was a scene in there. something very, very, um, um, very uh, outre. And as we went up and down the back stairs, back of the scenery, uh, the theater began to smell more and more of shit. <laughs> Unbelievable. Over of shit. And we actually, one of the boys that had been uh, hired as a, an extra in the class uh, had a father who was a butcher and he had brought along innards, big cow innards, big, big uh, intestines and uh, other things from parts, beef fowl from animal parts. And that's what we were smelling as the hours wore on and the, the stuff was left in uh, a, a cold bucket of water, but it still... Uh, Why did he bring the dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Why did he bring that? He was trying to help. What? <laughs> what was he trying he to was try, No, he was just trying to add to the general... To the mise en scène? The mise en scène, the dabble. <laughs> you know, the outstanding... Go as far as they could possibly go, I, you know. To bring in the horseshit. Just in the one night, but we thought we didn't know we had done that. It was sort of we couldn't figure it out until a couple of days later. And so that night we he didn't thought, share this contribution. With no, he didn't. No. And so we thought Paro and his group had sent over this stuff. <laughs> this was an evil up, prank. An evil prank. Stick up our opening. What was the, what, what is it, what was the, can you talk at all about the impetus, the impetus that, that Ludlum had behind making this kind of work? The impetus that the, the, like, why was he, why was he making Why did he work? go like that? Yeah, why did he go like that in this way, the, the way of uh, horse intestines and, and glitter? Well, he didn't ask for that, he didn't, you know, we didn't care. No, but the, the way of, uh, the way of, um, why was he the why was why is he why was he making the why did he decide to start making the work in the way that you all did? It was to shock, to you know, it was to the same impulse that uh, that the that a, 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 uh, an avant-garde has, which is to try to draw attention to yourself, and so he 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 let every impulse of his. Uh, also, he, he was intent on, on destroying the, the theater as we knew it, the, the, the four-act play, the, the melodrama, the, uh, everything being so neat and, and, uh, and all the rest of it. And um, he was, uh, that was his enemy. Mm. Um, and he, he went pretty far in doing that in the first couple of plays that Especially the um, the uh, Rabelais play, the Garden, the Garden of Earthly Delights, or as it was really called, Turds in Hell. Turds in Hell. Yeah, Turds in Hell. Love that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it, it was a very, it got to be a very long play. We put it on at, at midnight, after midnight, in a in what was theater that showed pornographic films um, and it went on at midnight and it went off at about five o'clock in the morning and the, the, the theater was filled, you know. Um, what, they, would you describe the piece as pornographic? Not really. No. no. Well, what do you mean by pornographic? 
to building these pieces. I tried out. to act. <laughs> I, don't know what it was. I, I don't know, uh, really. Um, what was your experience before starting on that work? Um, well, uh, on his work, well, it really, I was in Life of Lady Godiva. I was friends with Lonnie and Harvey Terrell, and I was drawn into the theater by them to help to help work on the theater. I was Beccaro's, um, uh, Beccaro's uh, secretary, or his um, amanuensis, or mm -hmm. anyway, I helped, uh, what do you call that, a script girl. Mm -hmm. I was the script girl and helped people with their lines and generally kept, you know, kept Beccaro uh, attuned to where we were in the rehearsal and stuff like that. One day, one of the uh, actors was missing, and he asked me to go with them to go in. And, and uh, that part became mine. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the role, Lola? What was what? Uh, what no, that role. That role? Uh, I was uh, a nun, a singing nun. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, an important part of of the pieces that were made. Yeah, it was part. Of, you know, it, it, it's comedy. You know, comedy is was used to it is is a, a destructive tool. You know, from Moliere or Shakespeare or any of those. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for many of the playwrights, that comedy is is a a force to dismantle. Versus what it was then. Yeah, because it was very vivid and was very uh, essential to New York off Broadway movement. It was wasn't just us. It was it was uh, a number of other people who were playing. And that's something that responds directly to the time that you're in. Whether yeah. it's considered camp or 
you know, um, Tegel was considered himself one of the first and most essential purveyors of the camp and, and drag. And drag. And there's also the element, especially in a piece like Big Hotel, of, of collage, I mean, in terms of the use of, of classical forms and pop culture forms, which was, mm -hmm. which is interesting talking about Andy Warhol. Yes. You know, that those, that those things overlaying each other. Mm -hmm. What was? There, there was that kind of. Uh, that kind of, can you describe that for people here who might not, who might not have seen Big Hotel or understand that piece? Mm -hmm. Well, it was a cut up of many, of, um, of many different, uh, uh, many different plays and uh, scenes. Uh, Big Hotel, you know, was a parody of Grand Hotel. And um, in it, there were, there were uh, you know, cut up, so there was, there was a piece of, um, a John Barrymore movie called uh, Dracula. Um, no, it wasn't Dracula. It was uh, Svengali. Svengali. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, Svengali, and uh, he lifted uh, a section uh, of it uh, to use in um, to use in. theatrical for 13 years? How many years? 13 years. 13 years. Mm -hmm. How do you think your work with them influenced your work when you moved to plays out of the company? Yeah. Well, how do you think, was it the same? Was it different? How did you, then how did you use what you were doing with them? Well, the clever directors who first used me was Bob Moss, who cast me as an Italian uh, woman uh, in a play by Clifford Odex called Out of the Fog. And actually, there's a movie that was made of this play. The play had uh, been put on by the Greek theater originally uh, with John Garfield and, you know, a number number of, of uh, people who did not play Greek theater in this theater play. And uh, there was this role of, a, of an Italian woman uh, with a thick accent, and he wanted me to be in it. And I wasn't a member of equity, but I was, a, I was able to um, be in it because equity has like a stepping stone uh, uh, thing where you pay the actor a reduced salary on their way to paying for uh, reduced for reviews for being an actor, for joining that group. Uh, so I, I you know, did this role, and it was good. You know, I can do a, I did an Italian accent, and, um, and I was this woman who was after one of the gentlemen Playwright Summer uh, uh, Theater Theater. Uh, it was put out in, out, in, uh, out by the um, uh, <coughs> that thing for the Wolves for their where is that Queens Queens yeah. Playwright Summer Play, Play, Playwrights Playwright Horizon to the Horizon. Um, and this was your first time. Was this first was the time first time out of the company. Yeah.
And was it was it much different for you as an actress, oh, as a performer? Yeah. 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 I didn't. Know, I didn't know the. It actually wasn't the first time, but let's not go back. Let's just go forward. Um, it. Um, uh, it. Uh, it was very different socially, and. Um, but as I told Bob Moss. And seeing him direct, I saw that Charles really, after being with him for 14 years, his style of directing had changed, and he um, uh, he was a very practical man of the theater. He always had been, and the style that he had uh, invented, or I thought he had invented. Something was a, was also a, a practical thing to help people quickly get to um, a characterization that they could use uh, to have tools to make the characterization they could use by telling them, uh, uh, suggesting, um, uh, suggesting um, uh, movie theater. said, you know, you, you can't really be this other person. You can only be yourself. You can never be anything other than yourself. So despite the fact that I might be imitating, um, who is the, the great? Mae West. No. Marlene. No. <laughs> uh, Barbara. No. <laughs> You know, she was in Grand Hotel. The great Ava Garden? No. no, no, she was in Jessica. Oh, no, no, she was in Grand Hotel. Joan Crawford. No, the uh, older woman. The great. Marie Dressler. Marie Dressler. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Thank <laughs> God there's an educated person in this room. Jesus. What's the matter with us? What's the matter with us? What have we done? What have we done with ourselves? Yeah, well. So I might imitate her as a way to help me with Ms. Covich in Bluebeard. Mm -hmm. But I can't become her. I'm not her. People might recognize that I was doing it, but it still it comes out different. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting though, that idea of, as, as a performer myself too, yeah. the imitation. Yes. I think it. But not to the extent that we do, because it, we not only might imitate the actor, but we might be doing a scene from a play that they were in, or a, uh, a movie that they were in, just as we took chunks of dialogue from Marine, Maria Montez movies for the sake of Maria Montez to do in this hotel. So it's, it was more. Everything more. More, more, more. <laughs> more. What? I, I, pardon my ignorance in the fact that I don't know why. Did you leave the company? Did you leave Ridiculous Theatrical when it was dissolved? No. When it finished, you left before that. Yes. And can you talk about the circumstances around you leaving? I think uh, there were actually many. Tiny, um, uh, tiny little things that would happen that brought me to uh, that point of leaving the company. But I can't, you know, it was my decision. <coughs> it was roles. It was uh, Charles and I, if you can believe it, we were bored with each other. <laughs> well, to describe a semi-serious note, real serious note, I was 
at that point, the oldest person in the company. And I really uh, felt that. It occurred to me that I was getting older and I didn't have one dollar in the bank and to work in for jobs for a number of years. And um, I didn't mind that. I didn't blame him or anything. I might have blamed him, but it wasn't his fault, really. Um, it just was the circumstance that we were under. And um, I had to do something. Otherwise, I would be shit out of luck. I would be starving to death. I would be a lot of things, but I wouldn't have anything to protect me in my old age. So I left and tried to join Equity and didn't join Equity. And then I had. A hunger to play a little uh, play Russian something or to play Chekhov and I wanted to play Shakespeare or something, I mean, other kinds of work. And uh, I did. You wanted to play Dirty Dorms or I wanted to play Dirty Dorms. Do you find and, uh, you know Do you find now I don't, I don't think I, uh, I think, uh, I think maybe if we were sitting in a theater and we were looking at a play, to find those connections, we find them. Right. But I can't, I can't think of anything right now that I oh, said, oh, specific. oh, I'll sit back for like five years. Right. Or, that, uh, or even anyone that's like in the non-negative sense, building on what happened then. Um, Probably there are, yeah. but I, I can't make the connection in my own mind. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I do see funny things. You know who I thought came closest to it because it was just so mad and, um, but it, I can't remember, I guess I can remember Charles the company doing things like that, but uh, I think the, Linda, you know, the, what is the, the Club Thumb, uh, the two, two Club Thumb Theater, they did that, was it Medea or something, and they, they, had a, they had a little rock band, and it was the girls' company, what's her name? And then we went back to see another play, Seven Weeks Going, and it wasn't at all oh, yeah. like that, but mostly they were completely. That was it here. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, they yeah. were nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and they were very, very good, really. The play was good, the actors were good. You're thinking of Brooke O'Hare, right? That's what. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Brooke O'Hare. Brooke O'Hare. She did a kabuki play, but. Jump of the Waves. Jump of the Waves was what you saw. Was that what mm -hmm. I said? Yeah. 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 I, I can still remember. It's Macbeth, I was sorry. No, 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 no. no, I know because I worked well, after that see. play I did trifles. Maybe you saw trifles after that. But Drum of the Waves was the Kabuki Theater. That's the one. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. The, and it was uh, wonderful. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. And they made great fools of themselves. Yeah. I appreciated that so much. And we saw it a play by Robert O'Hara that was uh, close. Well, it was like it, you know. Uh, I can't remember. It was in the basement of... Um, oh, at the Culture Club. The Culture Club, yeah. 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 And that really made me laugh mm -hmm. hysterically. Well, I would be yeah. very remiss if I did not say, tell the story that I, I think I told you this on Dartmouth. Yeah. Which was that I saw an interview with with Bette Midler, who is one of my favorite performers, who uh -huh. said, they said, uh, where did you come up with this character, this performance character you have? Mm -hmm. And she said, 
Well, I was terrified and someone asked me to do a cabaret in the 70s. And uh, I was really, or in the 60s, in the late 60s, and she said, I did a no, no fucking idea what I was going to do. And then someone took me to see the, ridic the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. And I said, oh, I have to do that. I have to be Lola Pashalinsky and Black Eyed Susan. That's who I have to be. I have to have though the big balls as big as those women. Well, you know, <laughs> that's literally like like that that like that continuance I going on of how she low she was really an amateur She was no a boat I think well I'm, I have to send you the clip. It's from I saw her and Larry King Live talking about it. Yeah. She talks a lot about the ridiculous in, in Love London. Yeah. It's really huge yeah, so I, I influence on so many point. people though that kind of but what you were saying, those people who are like balls out outrageous. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But anyway, we Caitlin, thank God, uh, jumping into the conversation. We can just like this is a whole Sorry. like conversation that we can no, Wait, no, can we're I good. Ask a question? No, I yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's start this, this whole mojo. I don't think it's too personal. I hope it's like where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> are you born? Are you from New York City? Where? I'm from the giant New York City. Clearly. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn. You are. Yeah. Giant in the sky. Thank you. I thought she was from the planet. The Venus. The Venus flytrap herself. Yeah. In our presence. Um, but yeah, no, but we can like open this com like this is like a broader dialogue in the com and this is the actual time in the evening where we can open up. So if you have any questions, otherwise I will continue to blah blah with blah, 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 <coughs> which is something that we are are very yeah. capable of doing. But does anyone have any questions? Jim? In all the years I've known you, I don't think I've ever asked you this question, so I'm gonna ask you tonight. What did your parents and family think of your career? What did they make of it? Did they come to see your work? Did they um, all that your outrageousness? Were you they um, uh, they were not against it. <laughs> I mean, they still would nag me to go get a job and everything. <laughs> uh, and I would invite them to see certain things. They saw the meal. And I just adored it. They loved it. They loved Charles. I didn't, I disinvited them to see Bluebeard. <laughs> you know, that made me offended now. But my two aged aunts, my Aunt Edith and my Aunt Helen, came to see Bluebeard. And I could tell uh, Aunt Helen was in the audience because she had a very distinctive laugh. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a cross between a donkey and, uh, <laughs> and his colleagues. And they loved me for being in that play. Tell them what you tell them screen. why people remember you in that play. That you mean in Bluebeard? Yeah. Well, the play had uh, a very significant scene in it of Bluebeard deflowering a virgin, um, a, a virgin. Uh, um, I was going to say consumer, <laughs> a virgin. Governess? A governess, mm -hmm. yes, a virgin governess of Black Eyed Susan, who was Hanazal, the Bluebeard's niece. And uh, we come to his island uh, to see him. And um, he falls in love with uh, the niece, the virgin, tremulous virgin. And on the other hand, he can't help to flowering the voluptuous governess, uh, and it results in um, a scene of such uh, uh, nudity and sexuality and exploitation of uh, sex acts that uh, it created a, you know, that lots of people uh, came and saw. <laughs> <laughs> Audience reactions like though? Did they go insane? Were they, they angry? They did go insane, especially in, in especially in Europe. You know, there was uh, we went and did it. We went to a, a, a theater festival in Belgrade uh, called the Beach Act. It was a big 
it was a very big international theater festival. And uh, we actually did something very unusual. We won second prize because no one had ever, no one but a, um, a, uh, a Romanian or Czechoslovakian or German or no one but a, And they loved, loved the play. When we toured it from Belgrade to Zagreb, we were in a theater that had uh, wooden seats. It was all wooden and very peaceful, beautiful. I must say the theaters, and you've probably traveled to Europe and seen some of the theaters there. They're so exquisite. And as a side thing, I'll just stick this in that, you know, we went to Nancy uh, to do uh, uh, New York. Um, we turned out to do, some, to do something else, but our voice was in this little opera house. Um, it was so beautiful. I had to sing a little song. It was so gorgeous. I, I felt like I was singing this time. The idea that Zagreb, and after the, the fuck scene, they um, applauded. They applauded so much and screamed, and they began to shake the wooden seats so that this horrible rattle, you know, that the, the building was going to come down, um, was set up. No, that Has that ever happened to you in a fuck scene since? Well, <laughs> And were the audiences there much different than here? Yeah, they are smaller. Yeah? Yes. Do you find that, our, or is it your experience that our audiences are still stupider? Our audiences? Yeah, in America. Not really. No. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't. I think it's, a, it's stupid to call the audiences stupid. <laughs> it is. I mean, there are stupid people in an audience, but. Um, you know, stupidity is uh, is rampant. And <laughs> there's no use blaming uh, Loveland much. Or, yeah. Did Loveland uh, figure in much about? Would you say that he was very concerned with the, or you all? that like their reaction to something like Bluebeard, was it a concern, was it a worry? Well, you know, in what way? In the way that you would piss a certain amount of people off or you would, you would, you would, uh, you would provoke them in a certain way that you couldn't get them back or you wouldn't run or you'd be a failure or any of that, all those usual things we worry about. <coughs> transition from experimental theater into more like straight theater with I assume Bob Moss and whoever you worked with after that quotes and whatnot how was that transition for you was it tricky or was it smooth sailing because you had already like gone so out there that you know films were just kind of it, it was tricky it was tricky sometimes I, I have an impulse in a rehearsal to do something and it would just not accepted. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was tricky, but I, it, it happened to me slowly because, uh, be, you know, because it was interspersed with
still working with Armand Bar directly. They don't let go. Huh? They don't like to let go of the good ones. No. They always so Richard Richard Cameron and Robert Wilson and and uh, you know, Mabu and uh, they also all these people also were beginning to have their feet in one uh, or one theater, one kind of theater and were carrying on the attempt to try to break into what you might call commercial theater uh, was there. Uh, Still there. Still there. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, can you talk a little bit about when Lee Brewer was um, on yeah, yeah. helping you audition for Tempest? This was one of your early steps yeah. outside of the company, also. That's when I got my my uh, my equity card. Um, yes, he called me one day and asked me would I be interested in being in uh, his production. Tempest first, he put it to me like, could I help him? and audition, just to show Joe Papp that um, it was possible to have a woman in these male roles. Which roles? Uh, just the one role, just the step no. Yeah, you were Trinculo. Huh? Trinculo. I was Trinculo. Was I? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yes, Trinculo. So uh, he said, why don't you try to do it like uh, Mae West? Mm -hmm. uh, so this was not my part. Um, so I did it uh, as Mae West. He liked it very much. And, and he ha had kept having me come back uh, to, act, uh, to act with other people. Not everybody was transsexualized. Uh, um, so Lou Zorich, Lou Zorich, who was um, um, somebody's husband. how um, Prospero um, got to Catalina. So this high helicopter came dangerously down <laughs> to the audience. And it was wonderful. And at the that's how it, At the Delacorte. And that's how the play began. And, um, and then what was I supposed to do? I, I, I just remember what you used to when you auditioned, well, he, he talked to you me about and, and office, he, office he, acting. He, all, yes, he called it. Don't, I don't want you to act like you would with the ridiculous. I want you to do what, uh, what is the usual kind of acting, which he called office acting. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that. Office acting. Yeah. Um, like your day job. Yes. Day job acting. Day job acting. You don't really give a fuck about that. No. Right. And you can't even do it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> skills. No, no. <laughs> Corey? I wonder, um, while you're talking about The Tempest, you're actually weirdly one of my first early theatrical experiences um, with the skin of our teeth at the Delacorte. And um, uh, I think I was like 13 or something. And you played the stage manager who like keeps interrupting, like getting people back on track. And it was like weirdly one of the first times I'd ever seen a play where oh and there's not like a wall and they're not like just in a living room and you know and so I wonder what that experience was like for you because for me it was like you know it was a big deal and maybe it, I, like or you know maybe we don't want to talk about that or <laughs> I mean, uh, Lewis. 
Lewis. Yeah. I just like with John Goodman and Francis Conroy and yes. Johnson. Yeah. I mean, what like was that like just being in that play? Was it? Like, I mean, it, it must be like a completely different experience than being in a movie. Like, no, it isn't because uh, 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 Francis Conroy What never gets discussed is what else is going on at the time. Right. So theater, the, the ridiculous theater, comes uh, on the wake of silent movies, uh, the 20s, the 30s. In the 40s, everything gets very serious. World War II movies, right. those characters that existed in movies in the 20s and the 30s, who were larger than life, and very specific cartoon-like characters, of which there were many, the ones who were the Italians, the ones who were the big women, the ones who were the nosy neighbors. The, they, these were all characters that everybody knew. So when you get to what, uh, what Ridiculous is doing and what is happening there, it's parodies of parodies. So it gets twice as big as the thing it's parodying because now everybody knows this character. When, when that character walks into the room, everybody knows that Mae West is a kind of woman. She isn't just Mae West. So when you're playing Mae West, you are not just simply referring to that person. You're not just simply using that dialogue. You are being all the characters that character ever is. And when the collage is being made of Grand Hotel, Grand Hotel is a collage. That's what makes it a hit. It's every kind of soap opera uh, happening at the same place, at the same time, in one venue. So all of these things are leading one to the other. And at the basis of everything that's going on is 
vying for the economic reward of what these things are all going to do. So MGM is making Grand Hotel because Warner Brothers is making gangster movies, and they are the same bigger than life versions of those things that are going on. So by the time I am looking at um, Ridiculous, by the time I am seeing uh, Camille at the place that nobody ever heard of ever again called Art Park, <laughs> uh, upstate New York, and we are on the same, I am there with the, something called the Grand Union and Improvisational Company, and Lola is there doing Camille, and they have the midnight show, and we're in the eight o'clock show, and nobody's coming to any of it <laughs> up in Art Park because they neglected to tell us that Native Americans are striking because we've taken their land. <laughs> uh, all of that is going on at the same time, and I am encountering a performance of Camille at midnight in the theater, which is so funny and so gorgeous and so like the essence of Camille. How can it be that? How can it be both the biggest parody of and at the same time, the thing itself. How is that happening? And, and the thing I can never forget on that stage, in that enormous outdoor theater, on that stage, the bed is foreshortened so that you are looking at it as if the entire world has squashed and Camille is going to die on half a bed and, and she's Charles Ludlow <laughs> with banana curls. And the hair and chest. <laughs> I mean, you, it, it has never happened in your head before that this could be the case. Yeah. However, Camille itself is that. And then yeah. there is this other Camille. Yeah. So in relation to all these things, when you talk about Marie Dressler, you're also talking about Margaret Dumont is the Marx Brothers. You're also talking about that big woman mm -hmm. who is outsized in those scenes, in those films, and, and in that period of time. And it makes, it, it makes your own singular work become a conversation about all other kinds of work. Really, to me, it, it does, it did. I just, I just feel like it's a bit so lacking in how we create work. I feel like every rehearsal room I'm in, or any play I develop, it's just purely about, you know, the human experience, and this is like this thing, and this is how like a guy feels when he's depressed. And, like that's the whole conversation. There's no broader conversation anymore, in my experience, except for the few, a few directors who would be considered, you know, weird or, or crazy, or like when I worked with Daniel or Evo, or a few people. Otherwise, it's all just like there's no concept of including other, you know, considering other performances or other parts of the medium. Why, the fuck, why is that? What happened? Uh, I don't know. Or is uh, that just my life? Am, no, is everyone it's, else it's fine? Just, <laughs> I think it's, you're asking me a question that I, I, I wish I had the answer to. I look around and I wish I had the answer. A couple of years ago, five, eight years ago, I, I felt that there was any need new work anymore. And, you know, the theater is dead, that the, the newly young people making work now are, are stupid. They don't know anything. They don't know nothing. And, and uh, I don't feel that way now. I feel like there's a lot of very exciting work. Uh, and uh, it, because of Charles, and others, uh, you know, the, the field is is wide open. It's wide open. There's tons of very ex ex and now that the pendulum has has uh, turned, and we're looking for excitement, and uh, and uh, they, they don't want to be tapped on the head and calm down. Some of them do. <coughs> There's still plays being written uh, to cater to that. That generation, that uh, 
those people. Uh, but look at the look at the uh, look at once. Yeah. Uh, once is, you know, it isn't a big deal as a story. It's it's a it's a fragile little poetic story. But the way it's being told is something extraordinary that the audience would first be invited to come up on stage and drink. They could get as drunk as they like. <laughs> And then That's how really we show up. You, yes, <laughs> and then be shown back to your seat. But it's it's a unique theatrical experience, and um, <coughs> I think uh, that's the reason it, it's uh, a hit. That's the reason it became yeah. uh, popular because it wasn't like everything else. And. some plays that stand between uh, the money making place and the art making place. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully they uh, still exist. Linda and I saw the piano lesson the other night. I have never in my life seen such acting, not, not, not musically. Mm. I, I thought it was a kind of a kind of miracle. Rosalind Ross. Oh, yeah. Yes. She's amazing. And and the uh, who was the, the Brandon Durden. Brandon Durden. Chuck yeah. Cooper. Chuck Cooper. Yeah. Chuck yeah. Cooper was doing ridiculous acting. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's that, what he's doing is on the scale. Of the yeah. Scale. On the scale. Oh yeah. Chuck Cooper's out of control. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but he's but the but still, it's a, a three act play. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, done in a traditional manner, but th that is, you know, he is breaking so many uh, bounds. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, it was uh, awe-inspiring, and it was heart-stopping, and it was gorgeous, and it made me uh, so happy to have been in the theater playing for that. And we can go on for You, but we are, I've already taken up 90 minutes of your time. <laughs> and so thank you guys. I, if there's any pressing things, we, the, a huge thing about the process in performance is that we hang out and talk to each other, the people in this room, and it's about uh, creating a broader dialogue, how we talk to each other as artists. So we're gonna all go for a drink, hopefully it's still water across the street. And there is a, a sign-up sheet there. If you're not on the mailing list to have these conversations, we will continue having them throughout 2013 13, <laughs> with uh, people from uh, Nature Theater of Oklahoma and people who work with the people of Enhova and people who work with the Debate Society. All sorts of people are going to come by. So thank you for coming, and thank you most of all to Lola Pashalinsky. <laughs>